Mentation Matters, Age-Friendly Healthcare Using the 4Ms Framework is a presentation of the South Florida Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program with Dr. Pandilla is the principal investigator and I am the clinical trainer. My name is Denise Krasinski. Some factors that contribute to healthy mentation include epigenetics, family dynamics, engagement in community, spirituality, adequate sleep, healthy diet, regular exercise and environment, life events, medication, motivation, and least impactful perhaps is genetic predisposition. As healthcare professionals, our role is to come alongside our patients to help them in organize epigenetics, that is modifiable factors in order to help them to avoid barriers to good health in order to aid them to achieve their best life. I have no disclosures or conflicting affiliations only in that I hope to achieve a meeting of the minds with you that we might see beyond the medical models that we grew up with to envision a more holistic model that perceives those coming to us for care as complex human beings with many moving parts who were created equipped to be autonomous and healthy. And we as healthcare providers are equipped with the knowledge to help our patients to care for themselves. The Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program is a federal workforce enhancement grant funded through the Healthcare Resources and Services Administration. One of the major goals of the grant is the promotion of age-friendly health care and the creation of age-friendly health systems. Age-friendly health care is a concept pioneered by the John A. Hartford Foundation and the Institute for Healthcare Improvement in partnership with the American Hospital Association, the Catholic Health Association of the United States, Kaiser Permanente, Trinity, and Ascension. The presentation goals are to explain the 4Ms framework, how optimizing mentation is integral to the establishment of an age-friendly health system. The 4Ms, we evaluate mentation within the framework of the 4Ms because the 4Ms are the pillars, so to speak, of age-friendly health care. With each elder patient's encounter, approach an interview with an eye to touching on the four things that evidence has shown matters and builds value into the elder adult's life. What matters is to know and align care with each older adult's specific health outcome goals and care preferences, including but not limited to end-of-life care and directives across settings of care. Medication. If necessary, use age-friendly medications that do not interfere with what matters to the older adult, their mentation, or their mobility. Mentation is our focus today to prevent, identify, treat, manage depression, delirium, and dementia across settings of care. And mobility, ensure that the older adult moves safely every day in order to maintain function and do what matters. Mobility optimizes virtually everything. Remember that the four M's are an integrated whole representing a summation of core issues found to matter to each individual. They're not an overlay of established care, but a new way of approaching patients with the goal of helping them to live their best life. As you support the four core areas that matter to your patients, you truly support the entirety of your patient's emotional and physical well being. Our focus today is the evaluation of mentation. We will explore factors contributing to healthy mentation and those factors that detract from the ability to enjoy life, to think clearly, and to remain active. So what is mentation? Evaluate mentation with an eye to cultural differences. Cultural prejudice impacts the quality of your care. Misunderstandings may color your opinion and degrade the care your patient receives. That must not be so. What would you think of this man's mentation if he walked into your office? And how would that change if you knew he were from Bangladesh? Would you expect him to conform to your cultural norms and preferences? Or would you be able to meet him where he is socially and culturally? Evaluate mentation with focus, with attention to focus and concentration. Include short-term memory and long-term memory. Does he remember what he had for his last meal or where he slept last night? Is he able to follow the conversation? Does he know why he's in your office? Is he able to read a bit of information in his own language and recall what was read? If the patient is confused or inattentive, 
evaluate mentation with use of appropriate standardized tools such as the MINICOG. Inquire as to sleep efficiency. Does he have any trouble falling asleep or staying asleep? Recall that poor sleep has an adverse effect on cognition, on affect, health, including fall risk, heart disease, and pre a predisposition to obesity and well-being. Some screening questions you may ask to evaluate well-being are, how was your day yesterday? Are you interacting with family, friends, or neighbors? Do you participate in a hobby? Ask him if he's feeling down, depressed, or hopeless. Patients will often wear a mask to hide feelings. Mild decline in memory that does not impair function is normal as we age. Encourage use of memory supports such as lists and calendars. Learning new things is slower, but should still be possible. Some mentation screening exams to evaluate depression and cognition. Use these as a part of a normal routine intake. P PHQ-2 is a quick two question assessment which inquires about the frequency of depressed mood and an anhedonia over the past two weeks. A PHQ-9 is a self-reported scoring tool that touches on items such as energy levels, interest in things that historically offer pleasure, sleep efficiency, appetite, feelings of hope and self-worth focus and likelihood of self-harm. It is useful to screen, diagnose, and measure the severity of depression. The geriatric depression screen is also a subjective depression screening tool with 15 questions in a yes or no format. Two widely used cognitive exams are the mini mental screening exam and the St. Louis University mental status exam. The mini mental um, screening, sorry, mini mental status exam is a testing tool of cognitive function among the elderly. It includes tests of orientation, attention, memory, language, and visual spatial skills. The St. Louis University me um, mental status exam is an 11 question screening questionnaire that tests orientation, memory, attention, and executive function using items such as animal naming, digit span, figure recognition, clock drawing and size differentiation. When screening for cognition, first consider sensory deficits that may need attention, such as hearing aids or eyeglasses. Consider medical conditions or motor limitations that are not reflective of cognition, but may impact ability to communicate. Example would be a stroke, which may cause expressive or receptive aphasia, thereby impairing ability to communicate or comprehend your question. Consider demographics such as their primary language, culture, educational level, vocation, and age. Is English their first language? As per the 2018 Census Bureau, 67 million people speak a language other than English in their home. Their culture may impact the manner of their communication. They may not feel it is polite to make eye contact. Consider social determinants of care. If they come from a persecuted demographic, they may not trust you enough to cooperate or give you correct answers to your questions or even follow instructions. Again, as a provider, evaluate the individual's focus. If there is an unexpected change in mental status as reported by a caregiver, consider delirium and its causes. Depression in the elderly is linked to a host of things negative thoughts, social isolation, tragic incidents, health issues, dementia, alcohol, anorexia, inactivity, or medication. So if you look carefully at this slide, you will see how each of these factors interplay to reinforce and intensify the others. If this patient came in to see you, where would you begin? Pick the low-hanging fruit. You would immediately evaluate her medication list and go from there. Slide 10, depression. Recall that depression is not a normal part of aging. Contributing factors are declining health and vitality, life changes and loss that lead to stress and sadness. Depression is progressive and disabling. It affects the quality of your patient's thinking, eating, sleeping, and motivation. 
all daily activities are impacted. Depression predisposes individuals to maladaptive behaviors in an attempt to cope, and ultimately depression may lead to dementia. After screening with accepted tools, the PHQ-2, PHQ-9, or the geriatric depression screen, act to consider likely sources, evaluate medication, sleep, personal loss, recommend lifestyle changes such as diet, exercise, social connections, and avoidance of alcohol and nicotine, which cause inflammation and predispose to de depression. If mobility is a concern, you may order physical therapy or occupational therapy. Encourage behavioral counseling, such as cognitive behavioral therapy. Ultimately, pharmacological therapy in conjunction with cognitive behavioral therapy may be beneficial. Encourage them to seek out activities in their communities to connect with others. In summary, understand that depression is a predisposing factor for dementia. Treat depression aggressively. Use non-pharmacologic options first. Recommend lifestyle modification, exercise and diet, review medications, optimize sleep, discourage alcohol and nicotine, and recommend behavioral counseling and social outlets as, ne as needed. Alzheimer's disease is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. It's like one of those hidden pandemics like child abuse and human trafficking. We don't see very many of the, those afflicted walking around, so we may not be fully aware of the magnitude of the problem. Let's consider some of the statistics. Alzheimer's disease is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. 16.1 million Americans provide unpaid care for people with Alzheimer's or other dementia. Between 2000 and 2015, deaths from heart disease have decreased 11%, while deaths from Alzheimer's disease have increased 123%. One out of three seniors dies with Alzheimer's or another dementia. It kills more than breast cancer and prostate cancer combined. Let that sink in. Early intervention could save up to 7.9 trillion in medical and care costs. This slide refers to 2018, but I'll tell you the newest information is that in 2021, Alzheimer's and other dementia will cost the nation 355 billion US dollars, including 239 billion in Medicare and Medicaid payments combined. Unless a treatment to slow, stop, or prevent the diseases developed in 2050, Alzheimer's disease is projected to cost more than 1.1 trillion US dollars. As you can imagine, the emotional toll on patients and caregivers is devastating. Nearly half of caregivers suffer psychological distress and accompanying health deterioration as they care for their loved one. Six million Americans are living with Alzheimer's in 2021. And every 65 seconds, someone in the United States develops the disease. By 2050, the number is projected to rise to nearly $14 million. 14 million people. Dementia is an umbrella term used to describe a range of symptoms associated with cognitive impairment. The course is progressive, often developing over many years. It is not reversible, reversible, and ultimately it will be fatal. Some types of dementia are Alzheimer's disease, which encompasses from 50 to 75% of the cases of dementia. Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. A small percentage is related to genetic factors, those with the apolipo-E4 gene. The majority result from epigenetic factors. Alzheimer's disease patients have plaques of beta amyloid protein and neurofibrillatory tangles made up of tau proteins that clumps and folds. Tau is a microtubule, microtubule associated protein that should stabilize neuronal microtubules under normal conditions. However, in pathological situations, tau proteins may undergo modifications, mainly through phosphorylation. It can result in the generation of aberrant aggregates that are toxic to neurons. 
it is thought that these clumps damage healthy neurons and the fibers connecting them. The most common symptom is short-term memory loss in an Alzheimer's patient. Vascular dementia encompasses 20 to 30% of those with dementia. The second most common type of dementia is caused by damage to the vessels that supply blood to the brain, reducing the blood supply. The most common symptom includes difficulties with problem solving, slowed thinking, focus, and organization. These tend to be more noticeable than memory loss. Lewy dot body dementia encompasses 10 to 25% of individuals. It's a common type of progressive dementia. Lewy body and Parkinson's dementia are caused by cytoplasmic A synuclein inclusion bodies that are abnormal balloon-like clumps of protein found in the brains of people with Lewy body dementia, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Some common signs include acting out one's dreams in sleep, seeing things that aren't there, problems with focus and attention, uncoordinated or slow movements, tremors and rigidity, such as in Parkinsonianism. Frontal temporal dementia. This is a group of diseases characterized by the breakdown of nerve cells and their connections in the frontal and temporal lobes of the brain. This is perhaps the most disturbing of the dementias because it changes the personality of your loved one. So the frontal temporal low areas of the, of the brain are generally associated with personality, behavior, and language related to the tau and or ubiquitin proteins, which is a regulatory protein that degrades and recycles protein. Common symptoms affect behavior, personality, thinking, judgment, language, and movement. Some risk factors for dementia are age, family history, APOE and three, Down syndrome. Some possible risk factors are head trauma, fewer years of formal education, history of depression, epigenetic factors like lifestyle and physical environment. The presentation of dementia varies according to the type and stage. Behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia or neuropsychiatric symptoms of dementia occur in up to 90% of patients with dementia. Early signs of dementia are short-term memory deficit, the possibility of progressive apathy and depression. Later, you may encounter bouts of confusion, lapses in judgment, behavioral changes, personal hygiene may also suffer. Ultimately, the patient may suffer difficulty speaking, swallowing, and walking. Your action is to evaluate for cause and educate and support your caregiver. This would include after your primary assessment in the primary care level, you would include referrals to neuropsychologists, geriatric psychiatrist, and a neuropsychologist. Prevention of dementia. With all of this dire news, it is important to remember that there is much that we have to offer in the way of pre prevention. Recommend an anti-inflammatory diet to your patients, Mediterranean diet, DASH dubbed the mind diet, short for Mediterranean DASH intervention for neurodegenerative delay, focuses on consumption of plant-based foods, berries, leafy greens, cruciferous vegetables, avocado, olive oil, on foods, eating fish, beans, chicken, and limiting red meat, saturated fats and sweets, and encourage drinking green tea every day. Observational studies suggest that the diet can reduce the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease by up to 53%, as well as slow cognitive decline and improved verbal memory. If you are able to persuade your patient to add a single healthy alternative daily, mouse models have shown great advantage in memory and cognition. Stay active, grow those telomeres. Studies show 30 minutes of exercise five times per week slows atrophy in the hippocampus, the part of the brain that controls memory and grows telomere length. The telomeres, are the, that's the DNA complex at the chromosome ends. These are predictors of human health and longevity. Encourage your patients to exercise. 
dance, Tai Chi, swim, walk, yoga, pool exercises, chair exercises, all of them are good. Avoid pro-inflammatory habits like drinking excess alcohol and smoking. Maintain a blood pressure below 140 over 80. Encourage brain exercises such as board games, cards, crossword puzzles, Sudoku, online memory games, learn a language or learn to play an instrument. Any type of learning, study and education may prevent or slow memory loss and, cog and delay cognitive function. When your sweet old man becomes disheveled and unexpectedly turns to you waving his cane angrily and demands that you get out of his house threatening to call the police, you may have a case of delirium on your hands. Recall that delirium may be superimposed on dementia. The term delirium literally means out of the track and was first used by a Greek philosopher in the second century AD to describe either stages of agitation or excessive somnolence. Delirium is a neuropsychiatric syndrome with an acute onset and a fluctuating course. The term delirium is used to designate reversible states of acute brain function commonly associated with the aged. Those with sen sensory impairments such as hearing loss, visual impairment, and those with pre-existing dementia are especially susceptible to delirium. The prevalence of delirium increases with age and nearly 50% of patients over the age of 70 experience episodes of delirium during hospitalization. It is underdiagnosed in almost two thirds of cases or is misdiagnosed as depression or dementia. The characteristics Abrupt onset from hours to days with fluctuation of lucid intervals during a 24 hour period. It is often reversible, characterized by inattention. This is the most frequent clinical finding in a delirium episode. Hyper or hypoactivity, altered level of consciousness with disorientation, aggression, paranoia, and frightening hallucinations. Your role as a provider is to evaluate for cause. Early diagnosis of delirium can lead to rapid improvement. If not treated in a timely manner, it can have a very poor outcome. When considering cause, consider common ailments of the aged, such as dehydration, electrolyte disorders, urinary retention, or urinary infections, pneumonia, COVID-19, fecal impaction, this would stress anybody out, metabolic changes, hypo or hyperglycemia, stress, depression, an unfamiliar environment, medication side effects, and injuries such as a myocardial infarction, congestive heart failure, which could cause hypoxia. Consider severe pain. In any case, act promptly to, to treat. Although it's usually reversible, it is distressing to the patient and loved ones who also need assistance in understanding what is happening. When not addressed promptly, mortality increases. The provider role is to support the family and caregiver with intervention, education, and social services support as indicated. Patiently reorient and reassure the patient remembering that he or she is in great distress throughout this time. After the delirium has cleared, search for underlying dementia. Prehabilitation. So on this slide, I'd like to briefly discuss the prevention of delirium by being proactive and aiding your patients to prepare for procedures or surgeries requiring hospitalization. If a procedure is imminent, capture a highly teachable moment in the lives of your patients. A crisis event is a powerful motivator to change behavior. Note those in the highest post-operative risk group and consider prehabilitation to engage the patient in goal making and to increase his or her functional capacity before a potentially inciting event such as a surgery or procedure. Be proactive in ordering physical therapy, encourage lifestyle alterations such as walking exercises three to four times weekly, practice deep breathing exercises, encourage smoking and alcohol cessation and have them consider setting post-procedure goals. Studies have shown that advanced preparation and goal setting, even for two to three weeks before a procedure, decreases hospital stay and cost of post-surgical complications. Prehabilitation is currently a treatment modality in the United Kingdom and rapidly gaining recognition in the United States. 
The importance of sleep in healthy mentation is central. From the left upper corner going clockwise, notice that lack of sleep leads to the following, memory issues, trouble with thinking and concentration, accidents, high blood pressure, weight gain, risk of heart disease, poor balance, low sex drive, risk for diabetes, weakened immunity, and mood changes. Help your patients to get some sleep and be sure to get seven or eight hours sleep per night yourself. Mentation and medications. Sedatives, including benzo benzodiazepines and non-benzo hypnotics, are associated with impaired performance on mobility and cognitive testing in high-functioning community-based older adults. Zolpidium was implicated in 21% of emergency department visits for adverse drug events related to psychiatric medication among adults 65 years and older. Medication is the first and easiest intervention to prevent declines in, admit, in mentation. Some adverse effects associated with anticholinergic use in older adults include um, memory impairment, confusion, hallucinations, dry mouth, blurred vision, constipation, nausea, urinary retention, impaired sweating, and tachycardia. A case-controlled study found an association between anticholinergic use and risk of community-acquired pneumonia, dementia. All drugs with anticholinergic properties block acetylcholine receptors. Chronic interference with acetylcholine receptors is harmful to all individuals, especially to speak to the population of our focus, the elder adult. Acetylcholine plays a role in motivation, arousal, attention, learning, and memory. It's also involved in promoting REM sleep. Studies have shown that elderly individuals taking anticholinergic drugs were at increased risk for cognitive decline and dementia. Discontinuing anticholinergic treatment is associated with a decreased risk of cognitive decline and dementia. In the case of all of those who are caretakers of those with dementia, delirium, or depression, educate your caregivers to look for and understand the root cause of behavior. Look for antecedents, what preceded the behavior, and educate them about the disease, especially dementia. Consider neuropsychology referral to instant to assist in detection and later grading of severity of dementia, which may be very helpful to caregivers in the management of their loved ones. Recommend that they enlist the help of extended family and friends. They may be unwilling to ask for help to their own detriment. Encourage caregivers to consider respite care, which may be able to give them a break from a few hours in a day to entire weekends and offer resources to caregivers. Do all that you can to support caregivers by offering resources that they desperately need. Here are some resources for caregivers of those with dementia. There's the Alzheimer's Association, the AARP Foundation, Connect to Effect, Community Connections, YMCA 360, Jewish Community Center, helpguide.org, Respite Care for Elder Caregivers, and you see the, the website for a respite locator. Encourage them to access these resources. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. Intervene early when depression, delirium, or dementia presents. Evaluate medication, medical conditions, and the social determinants of health that may predispose to the 3Ds. There are many resources available from physical therapy, occupational therapy, neuropsychology, behavioral health counseling, eyeglasses, hearing aids, nutritional counseling. There are a plethora of online resources. Offer the resources available to help your patients keep the most as valuable asset that they have, their minds. Until ruled out, consider a change in mental status to be delirium and be aware of the risks of delirium superimposed on dementia. Consider language and cultural differences 61 million people in the United States speak a language other than English in the home. 
If your organization receives Medicare, Medicaid, or reimbursement from federal health programs, federal health and state law requires that healthcare organization provide language access services to limited English proficient and deaf and hard of hearing patients. This includes qualified medical interpreters for oral interpretation and written translated documents for information and consents. These violations are listed under the 1964 Civil Rights Act legislation, Title VI. While we have come a very long way in the care of delirium, depression, and dementia, we yet have a long way to go lest we become complacent. B.B. King is the rhythm and blues icon, shared his love of life with fans until the age of 89 years old. Remember, age is just a number. Optimizing mentation is vital for the well-being of our patients, integral to the establishment of an age-friendly health system, and a generous gift to the world if you can preserve this mentation. Here are my references. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me at dk644 at nova.edu. Thank you for completing the survey. If the link doesn't work, please try scanning the QR code. It records your, your comments, your presence, and I very much appreciate you. Thank you very much.